Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Anne Markey and I am a Christian author and speaker and head behind the blog OneDeterminedLife.com. For the last couple of weeks, as we were inching our way closer and closer to Christmas, I wanted to kind of get away from more of the teaching sessions to do some biblical-based devotion time, just so that we can take some time every week and just set aside some time where we can really think about the Lord and who he is and the reason behind the season. Now, Christmas is only a few days away, and I know that this week is going to be really busy because if your school's like my school, there's Christmas concerts and Christmas parties and a lot of things, and it can get really overwhelming. But I want you just to take a few minutes and spend time with the Lord and consider him as we get so much closer to Christmas. We live in a world so confused about what true love is. And I've had more than one conversation with my children about love and what it means. The world focuses on romantic love, but the word of God tells us that there's actually four different types of love. And when I'm having these conversations with my kids, that was brand new information for them. They didn't realize that there was different ways that we can love one another. And so we know that there's different types of love and that friendship love is very different than romantic love. I don't wanna to spend too much time as to what the world tells us about love because the full purpose of this is to focus on Christ. And we know that the word of God gives us a perfect example of what true love is and what it looks like. John chapter three, verse 16 and 17 say this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I have three kids. And one of the things we do is we ask our kids, do you know how much we love you? And then they'll say, how much? And we'll say, we love you to the ends of the universe and back. I can't think of one scenario that would lead me to choose one of my children to die in the place of someone else. Most of my husband's family isn't saved. And for the longest time, I had this fear that if I prayed for my family's salvation, it would somehow mean that my kids would have to like get hurt or die. I'm not sure where that fear come from, came from, probably from the devil since it's not from the Lord, but that fear kept me from praying for them because I'm not willing for my kids to experience any type of pain, even if it meant somebody else's salvation. Now, thankfully, the Lord has helped me process some of that and he's given me some wisdom as to how to pray for my family, overcoming that fear. But this is just an example that I am selfish. I'm not gonna choose my kids to die over somebody else. I would choose for my life to end instead of my children, but I just never wanna see my kids in any type of pain. Now we compare that to God's love for us. God loves us so much that he sent his only son on earth to live a life here on earth and not just to live it, but then to die. And then three days later, rise again. I can't imagine what that would be like. We know that heaven is an amazing place. And just going from heaven to earth in itself, even if Jesus did nothing else, would be an act of love. Like I'm giving up all this stuff for you to come to earth. But that's not where it ended. It goes even further than that. The Old Testament tells us that we're sinful and that the only way to pay for that sin is a blood sacrifice. Something or someone had to die. Now, throughout the Old Testament, those were the perfect lambs. 
and they represent the perfect lamb of God, Jesus himself who came to earth. Because even though those lambs were perfect, they weren't good enough. People didn't have to just do one sacrifice in their entire life. They had to come over and over and over and over again. But Jesus, he came and he died only once because his sacrifice was perfect. So his, he's the one that took our place so that we can have relationship with the Father. And even though I've been a Christian for a long time, I still have a hard time wrapping my mind around that type of love. Because like I said, I could never do that. I am completely selfish. I don't think I would ever choose my kid's death over somebody else. Now, there is that little fear in me that now that I've said that, the Lord's going to test me and I'm trying to get over it. But this idea that my selfish love is no comparison to the love that God has for us, that he was willing to sacrifice his son for us. That's incredible. And every single time I think about it, I'm just amazed and in awe and wonder about God and his love for us. And it actually leads me to worship because I just think, wow, you are so amazing. But you know what? The Bible doesn't end there. It gives us this perfect example of Jesus Christ himself, but then it actually also defines love even more. And it tells us exactly what love looks like. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 8 say this. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Now, chances are you've heard those verses before, and I bet you that you heard them at a wedding. And these verses are used a lot to talk about love between a husband and a spouse. And I think they do fit because the scripture does call us and sets this standard of what true love is. But these verses aren't actually talking about marriage. They're talking about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. They give particular and very specific character traits of what looks like and how somebody acts when they love you. And the only person that fulfills every single one of those to perfection is the Lord Jesus Christ. When I was in university, I felt really alone and like nobody noticed me and that nobody loved me and I really struggled with this. And during this time, I would sometimes talk to my family about it and they would reassure me. They say, it's okay that you don't have any friends. We love you. We love you so much. You're amazing. But in my mind, that love didn't count because I was like, they have to love me. I'm their family. I'm their daughter. I'm their sister. They have no choice but to love me. And so it wasn't good enough. And as I was working through these things and as I was processing all these things I was feeling, the Lord revealed himself to me and he brought me back to scripture and he reminded me how much he loves me. He taught me a better love because I've learned that friends come and go, but the Lord never changes. He's always near. He never changes and his love for me never changes regardless of what I do. I can be my worst self on the worst day and God's love for me stays the same. He might not be happy about what I'm doing, but he loves me. So if you're here today and you're feeling a little bit uncertain, maybe you're feeling lost and you might even be feeling unloved. I understand that. I've been there. And every single time I've had those feelings, the Lord's been so gentle to bring me back towards him and say, human relationships will sometimes fail. 
friends, family, spouses, whatever, there's going to be that friction sometimes. And sometimes we can get discouraged and we can even look towards other people to fulfill all that love for us. But when we put those standards, those high standards on humans, we're going to get disappointed. And the only person who's never going to disappoint for us, who's never going to not meet those standards is the Lord himself. So if you're having any of those feelings, what I want you to do is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and read verses 4 through 8. And make sure you have a pen and paper ready when you do this, because this is what I want you to do. Those verses characterize love. And so what I want you to do is for each characteristics to write it down. And then think of some examples. So the first one we have, it says love is patient. So what I want you to do is to write down love is patient. And then I want you to take a few minutes and to think about and to write down all the different examples you have of maybe your own life, your friend's life, or even scripture of very specific examples when the Lord showed you patience. And if you have a hard time thinking of one, I can give you one and you can write this down if you'd like is the fact that God hasn't come back again shows his patience. In the Old Testament, we read that before he flooded the earth, the Lord looked at the earth and was like, these men are horrible. And he sent the flood to destroy, like to destroy them. And the word of God tells us that one day he will destroy the earth. But the longer he goes without doing that just shows how patient God is because he isn't willing for anyone to die. He doesn't want anybody to be separated from him. So he continues to extend earth so that as many people as humanly possible will choose God himself. And so every single day that passes that the Lord does not return shows us his patience for people. So take a few minutes and add to that list. What are some other things that he has done? Or what are some other ways the Lord has shown you patience? And then when you're done that, I want you to go to the next characteristic. And that one is kind. And again, I want you to do the same thing. Think of all the examples of all the times the Lord was kind to you. And I want you to do that exercise for every single characteristic in that verse. Now that might feel overwhelming, so I don't want you to do that all at once. Maybe just do one day at a time. So the first day you can talk about patience, the second day about kindness, and after a few days, you're gonna have this comprehensive list and proof of how God shows his love towards you in all these different areas. That way, the next time you're feeling discouraged or maybe the next time you're feeling unloved, you now have this list of evidence to tell your brain, no, I have proof here that the Lord loves you. Look what he did. And to carry that with you. Because when you do that, you're going to be reminded of what true love looks like. When you have God's example of love, It just helps in every aspect when it comes to relationship for others because it helps you show love better. And then it it helps you accept love differently because now you know what true love looks like. So when somebody isn't treating you properly, you know that there's a better way and you can make those choices in your relationships easier because you have this example to look to. And you're quickly going to notice the difference between biblical love and the love that the world tells us about. Because the love from the world is conditional and it changes over time and it is not consistent. But when we look to the Lord and we see his love for us, It never changes. It is not dependent on what we do or what's going around in the world. It is consistent and it leads him to action. The Lord has already proven himself to you. He's proven his love for you already. He sent his son to die for you so that you can have a relationship with him. And that is true love, is sacrifice. And it's very, very different than the world tells us about what love is. And so when we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ 
It helps us learn more about love, but then we feel loved because we are going to the right source for love. Because when we expect perfect love from the world, we're going to be disappointed. But when we look to the Lord for perfect love, it will never disappoint. I want to close our time together by reading two different verses. The first one is Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, and it says, And above all these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3 says, So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I could spend all day going through scripture and showing you examples from the word of God about God's love for us. But we see very clearly that the love the Lord calls us to is a completely different playing field than what the world does. And it encourages us to love each other sacrificially, which is hard to do. The word of God tells us that love is crucial, that we can be doing a bazillion other things, but if we don't do those things in love, if we're not looking to, for God, for the perfect love, then none of it is gonna matter. So we do need to prioritize this, that everything we do should be out of love, and that love should not be coming from ourselves, and it's not what the world has to offer, but that that love should be coming from the Lord. So the Lord fills us with love, so that we in turn can turn to others and love them and show them that that is how God loves them. So I hope that this has been encouraging to you and to remember that I know sometimes Christmas can be hard. And I know that sometimes showing others love at Christmas time can be difficult. So just be encouraged to know that you don't have to love them out of yourself but that you can turn to the Lord to fill you with love for others and that will help you in your relationships with one another. Let's take some time to pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us this perfect example of what love is and that goes on and gives us very specific characteristics of what love actually looks at looks like and gives us the perfect standard help us to look to you for that love that we need in turn to love others and that only comes from you so help us to spend that time with you to be filled with your love so that we can love others in return thank you for being with us and i just pray this time be a blessing to all of us amen thank you so much for joining me i really appreciate this time that you've taken just to spend some time with me in god's word i hope you've been encouraged by these devotions and I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and I'll see you next week. Bye.